comrades, I think that uh, Percy Shelley, if he was here today, would be pretty pleased by the turnout. <laughs> got a series of meetings in this series, and I think it's true to say, I'm quite confident it's true to say, and one of the reasons why we took this hall was that the meeting which would get the biggest amount of people, in spite of all the important subjects that have been discussed in this, uh, <laughs> in this series, would be the meeting about a poet that died about 170 years ago. <laughs> and, the, and that might appear to be very remarkable. Why have we got a, a big socialist meeting on Shelley? Because after all, I imagine, for many of you, and certainly for many of the people that aren't here, Shelley is just another of those poets that is taught to us in the schools. You have to learn a lot of rather twee stuff about skylarks and clouds and west winds and we have to learn it by heart and say it properly to the teacher but it doesn't seem to have any relevance whatever to the tradition out of which we come and so what are we doing here and what is the purpose of this meeting and I want to say first of all that there are in the history of uh, English literature British literature two Shelleys and the two Shelleys are very very accurately portrayed by a couple of meetings which took place a very long time ago in 1892 as a matter of fact in London on September the 4th 1892 to celebrate the hundredth year of Shelley's birth now the first meeting was held in Horsham I don't know if anyone here has ever been to Horsham I've been to Horsham a couple of times and uh, I didn't see anything moving I think uh, on one occasion a man crossed the street and that was regarded as a sensation. Horsham is a place where rich people live and come to buy things in the marketplace. It's a very, very, it was in 1892, just as it is now, a very, very rich place, a place for wealthy people. And yet a meeting was held there to celebrate the, uh, this hundredth year after Shelley's birth. <coughs> and uh, it was held because that was where, or the area in which Shelley was born. He was born the son of a rich aristocratic landlord, landowner there, nice decent Whig family. He was born into there and the nice decent Whig families of 1892 came to celebrate their child, uh, their prophet. Somebody after all who'd come from Horsham and therefore must have been quite important after all he was the son of Sir Timothy Shelley who also was a baronet and somebody of very great importance indeed he was even from time to time when he felt like it a member of parliament and, uh, and, and the meeting that was held there was a very remarkable meeting all the important literary people of the time was there Melvin Bragg was there or, uh, <laughs> Melvin Bragg of his time was there and Lady Antonia Fraser was there and all those people were there at that time to come and celebrate the Shelley of Sussex the Shelley the son of the Sir Timothy and one of the people that was there was, was Bernard Shaw, who was uh, somebody who knew a little bit about Shelley. And he wrote an essay about that meeting, which I think summed up very well what the atmosphere was there. On all sides there uh, went up the cry, We want our great Shelley, our darling Shelley, our best, noblest, highest of poets. We will not have it said that he was a leveller, an atheist, a foe to marriage, an advocate of incest. He was uh, a little unfortunate in his first marriage, and we pity him for it. He was a little eccentric in his vegetarianism, but we are not ashamed of that. We glory in the humani humanity of it, with morsels of beefsteak fresh from the slaughterhouse sticking between our teeth. We ask the public to be generous, to read his really great works, such as the Ode to a Skylark, and not to gloat over those boyish indiscretions known as Leon and Cynthia from Isus, Rosalind and Helen, the Senshi, the Mask of Anarchy, etc., etc. Take no notice of the church papers, for our Shelley was a true Christian at heart. Away with Jefferson, for our Shelley was a gentleman, if ever there was one. If you doubt it, ask Lady Antonia, or, or Melvin, or, or Edmund Gott, who was the man that came particularly on that occasion to talk about the Shelley that they were celebrating there. And that was all very odd, because in his lifetime, Shelley had been hounded and ignored by all the literary lords and ladies of the time. He, in the whole period of his life, he was only 30 when he died, but in the whole of that period, with enormous amount of works that he wrote, practically none of it was published. He made nothing at all, literally nothing, 
from all those poet, poems which were celebrated, or some of which were celebrated, at that Horsham meeting. The Ode to the Skylark made nothing. Uh, all those odes made nothing. He couldn't find a publisher to distribute his work. Very, very few of, his, uh, of, his, of, his, uh, uh, of what he wrote was published at all. He was uh, hounded by the Home Office. A number of places that he went to, he was hounded out of it by Home Office spies. Everything he wrote was read by the spies in the Home Office. When his first wife committed suicide, his children were denied him by the Lord Chancellor, uh, the Lord Chief, Chief Justice, Lord Chief Justice Widgery, I'm so sorry, uh, Lord Eldon, because, she, uh, because, according to the Lord Chief Justice, he was an atheist. Uh, the obituary that was written about Shelley when he died in, uh, when he died in a storm, uh, drowned in a storm of Italy, uh, read like this, started off like this, Shelley, the writer of some infidel poetry is dead, now he knows whether there is a God or no. <laughs> that was the attitude of the, of the time in which he lived. And really, the meeting in Horsham and that Shelley, that, that, is the, that, 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 that has a uh, common ground with the Shelley that was handed and brutalized and exiled and pushed out of different places where he went to live when he was alive. Because just as the lords and ladies of literature hounded Shelley when he was alive, so they patronized him 60 or 70 years later when he was good and safe and dead. And they patronized him in a whole number of different ways and they're still patronizing him today. I have uh, here a book uh, by Richard Hughes. This is a, well, not a book that I'm recommending. Uh, this is a book that I remember with some bitterness because it's the book that we had to learn at school. It's a school textbook, Shelley Hughes. And uh, one of the ways in which Shelley was patronized, one of the convenient ways in which he was patronized was that any ideas that he may have had, any ideas at all, were quietly censored from the textbooks. You read here, and you read right through this little book, you read quite a lot of poetry, some of it very good poetry, but you won't read here one single idea. You won't read here one single one of the many, many poems he wrote, he wrote which had the uh, inspiration of ideas about the society in which he lived. There's another book here. I can find it. Which is uh, doubtful. This is the Penguin edition of Shelley, which was edited by a very fine lady of uh, letters, a very nice Tory lady called uh, Isabel Quigley. No poet better repays cutting. <laughs> no great poet was ever less worth reading in his entirety, and she is set to work with the shears and the scissors. And you look through here and you can't find any ideas. All the poems in which he had ideas, a poem which he wrote, a poem which he wrote, a very long poem called The Revolt of Islam, which is a poem about revolution and what revolution is about, there's about seven or eight stanzas of that. Queen Mab, which is one of the greatest revolutionary poems ever written in the English language, has here three or four, right at the beginning, three or four lyrical stanzas with nothing, nothing none of the ideas which went into the poem are in that whatever. Uh, here is a, 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 a the non such edition, very beautiful book. Very beautiful, very expensive, which you can buy, second-hand bookshop, Shelley. That's a very big, fat book, you'll see, more than a thousand pages, very, very nice rice paper, edited by Professor A.S.M. Glover, who is a professor of literature somewhere or other. I hope he's still alive, and I hope he is here tonight, because he can be on my to say. <laughs> Peter Bell and Oedipus are mainly of interest as proofs that a great lyric poet may fail lamentably outside his own proper field, especially in work of a genre that re requires a sense of humour. I don't know when <laughs> Professor Glover last laughed, believed to be 30 or 40 years ago, perhaps he had a laugh, but he doesn't have a word to say about some of the funniest uh, poems ever written in the language, Peter Bell and Oedipus, wonderful satire about the people that were in charge of society at that time, not a single word appears there. The work about Shelley, which is perhaps the most famous textbook written on the subject, which is a work by Edward Dowden, professor of literature at Cambridge, needless to say, this is a book all the way through, uh, it, it is a, it is, it says that Shelley is a wonderful person, a really, what a saint, Really, Shelley was a saint, and one of the reasons why he was a saint was that we can ignore his ideas. <laughs> this book, he's referring to Queen Mab, 
may be regarded as the last development of that contentious, argumentative side of Shelley's nature, which found expression at an earlier time in the letters addressed by him under same name to eminent champions of orthodoxy. That sort of patronage. When Shelley wrote Peter Bell III, which is a tremendous attack on the apostasy of Wordsworth, on Wordsworth giving up all his ideas which he had about the French Revolution, here Darwin got even even Darwin has got to have a word of criticism. We cannot regret. We must regret that a piece of criticism, more than half unjust in its reference to Wordsworth, remained unprinted until that great poet had won the mastery of the spirits of a generation of Englishmen, which is his due. How dare he attack Wordsworth? For a professor of uh, a professor of English literature will get his own back on Shelley, even if it's by patronising him in this enormous. 600 page work which uh, hardly mentions a single one of Shelley's ideas. Now that's, that's the one of the Shelley. That is the way in which they managed to censor him. To take the works, the ideas that he had and very, very simply to cut it out. There's a, a book here called The Philosophical View of the Form. This is, a, I think, the only edition of this book that was ever published. If you look inside, you'll see the date is 1920, which was a hundred years after it was written. It's a tremendous polemical pamphlet about the political situation at the time, calling for revolt in all different ways, right through the society. Yet it was censored, and not only censored during his life, but when Mary Shelley tried to publish it in the collected works of Shelley, after Shelley was dead, she was told by her uh, father-in-law that he, she couldn't have any money for the children if he published works of this kind. And therefore, for a hundred years, this work remained unpublished, censored. There's a, an introduction to the poem Hellas. It's all about Greece. All the stuff about Greece in his inn, except there's a paragraph in there that's about Britain and how the situation in Greece reflects what's going on in Britain and the need for revolutionary inspiration that was going on in Greece to reflect itself in Britain. That paragraph, just that one rather nasty little paragraph, was cut out for 96 years after it was published, just simply censored. And therefore you see all the way, all the way through the history of Shelley, that Shelley that Shelley of, uh, oh, that was patronized by convention, by the lords and ladies of literature, all through that period, that Shelley was, uh, was censored. Uh, if you go to University College Oxford, and I'm not uh, recommending that anyone should do that, and if by any chance you should want to go and play football at the University College Oxford, you've got to walk down an alley, and if you go down an alley, you'll pass an enormous, huge, tomb-like operation with a really disgusting white naked statue uh, of Shelley, borne up by the angels of the sea uh, and, and sea lions, all held up there in this wonderful uh, uh, emblazoned tomb. And there they're fantastically proud, you'll see a little notice on the side, Shelley was at University College Oxford in 1811, and he's one of the great alumni of our college, one of the people that we look back with pride. What he doesn't say is that he wasn't very long at University <laughs> College Oxford. He was there for one term and a half. Halfway through the second term, he's been expelled for writing the first ever published, published uh, uh, document in English which attacked religion. The Necessity of Atheism. He wrote The Necessity of Atheism, distributed around Oxford, sent it to the master of the college, sent it to the local bishop, <laughs> sent it to a few people of that kind. We'd like your views on this. I will. <laughs> I've thought about the problem, I've come to the view that there is no God, what do you think? I'd like to have a little debate about it, pulled up the Master's College, after he'd written it, immediately expelled. No reference to that in University <laughs> College Oxford. If you go out to a dom, an old dom, one who was alive in 1811, most of them, <laughs> most of them were, and you say to them, you say to them, uh, excuse me a moment, what, is, uh, what about the Shelley that was expelled? They say, oh, was he expelled? I didn't know that, I'm sorry, we'll have to put that right. But still you can buy postcards at University <laughs> College Oxford, which have this wonderful statue on it. Now that, that is the, the one, Shelley, the tradition that's been passed down through the ages, passed down through the textbooks particularly in schools and universities. The Shelley that has now been scrubbed off the A-level syllabus, but when he was on the A-level syllabus, brought, through, brought to the A-level syllabus by books by Richard Hughes, Isabel Quigley, Glover, and all the rest of those people introducing him as someone who was an entirely neutered ly lyrical poet. Occasionally, I read this about him, occasionally disturbed by a recurring pain in his side. That really is the explanation <laughs> for these argumentative problems. And then, an unfortunate homosexual experience when a boy. That's really it, isn't it? <laughs> then, we can dismiss it all. The fellow was odd from time to time. But the trouble was that he couldn't really be, be clasped into the bosom of that 
orthodox heterosexuality for which Horton stands. That is the, the, the tradition uh, of Shelley which has come down to us. Now there's, a, there's another Shelley and that's really the purpose of this meeting tonight. There's another Shelley, altogether different Shelley. There's an atheist and a republican and a feminist Shelley, the real Shelley, the Shelley who had ideas, who had revolutionary ideas, and the whole of whose writing was inspired by those revolutionary ideas, and to separate those revolutionary ideas from, uh, from Shelley is no more than to neuter and castrate, uh, to, to, to castrate the poet himself. That same meeting that was held in Horsham, that evening, Bernard Shaw went away from, uh, from uh, 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 Horsham, a bit sick, he was a bit sick, he said that uh, he, any reason why he hadn't intervened was that they were having a free library, they were putting money for a free library. And then when he came out and he looked at the free library, he saw there was a statue of Shelley outside with a Bible under his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he wished he had intervened. At any rate, Shaw went on to a meeting that was held not far from here, in the east end of London, in Shoreditch, not far from Cotton Gardens. <laughs> in, uh, <coughs> That's entirely coincidental. Uh, in which there were a number of workers there. Oh, 100, 200 workers come to the meeting. Workers from the east end of London in their caps come out from work, come in the evenings of meeting. And there was people speaking there that were atheists and uh, republicans. There were Irish republicans, people of that time, speaking at the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, one of the uh, workers in the hall rose and read, or said, because they knew it, they passed it uh, from mouth to mouth over several generations, a quite different poem. A poem which started like this. Men of England, wherefore plough for the lords who lay ye low? Wherefore weave with toil and care the rich robes your tyrants wear? Wherefore feed and clothe and save from the cradles of the grave those ungrateful drones who would drain your sweat, nay drink your blood? Seven or eight verses, straightforward, simple, not very lyrical, but talking about the way in which the men of England at that time worked and sweated for the drones who would drain their sweat and drink their blood. And he knew that, and he read that out. And that was a, a different kind of Shelley. And how was it that the son of a, uh, an aristocratic landowner in, in Sussex, the son of a Whig MP, uh, somebody who went to Eton and Oxford, how was it that so young, how was it, that somebody so young could come to all these revolutionary ideas to be able to write poetry of that kind. And the answer to that is very, very simple, to do with the times in which he wrote. To do with the times in which he wrote, are which also are never discussed by any of these people that write or talk or teach about Shelley in the schools today. To do with the fact that the times in which Shelley was born in 1892, three years after the French Revolution, and that the French Revolution had inspired, right the way throughout Europe, and indeed right the way through the Americas, whole new ideas. People began to stand up and to think maybe that all the superstitions and all the ideas of passing on orders from above weren't the case. Maybe that wasn't the way in which you should view society. And all the poets of that time, wherever they were born, all the people with any ability whatever, including all the English and British poets that were writing at that time, all of them at the outset were infected with the enthusiasm of that revolution. Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, Barr and Southey, all these people that you read, in, uh, people read in schools and uh, uh, universities, all those people that were writing at the same time, just about that period, in those 20, 30 years, all those people were infected with the enthusiasm of the French Revolution and wrote about revolutionary upsurge. Even Wordsworth in his youth used to write about the menace of gold and the power of reason. People used to talk about how reason now can be brought up against superstition, how individual working people are as good as the people who dominate them, and so on and so on. And those things happened because of the French Revolution. And the French Revolution, of course, terrified, particularly as it went on and developed, and the left in the French Revolution began to seize power there, and the masses kept the left in power in the French Revolution. What happened in the British ruling class was a great terror took them, seized with terror, that the Jacobin ideas, the revolutionary ideas, the ideas of reason against superstition would start to grip people in Britain. And therefore they moved troops into the cities and they unleashed the most terrible repression right across the whole country. All different kinds of spies put into the, put into the cities, put into workplaces in order to detect out whether or not there were Jacobin or revolutionary ideas of one kind or another. And Shelley developed 
in that atmosphere, this is the point, even at Eton, where he refused to take part in the fagging operation, even at Oxford, where he uh, challenged the, the rights of people to tell him whether he should believe in God or not, those things came right in his youth because of the French Revolution. And what comes out of all his poetry, the first thing that comes out of all his poetry, is that deep, intense hatred and contempt for authority for people who put themselves in authority without any responsibility for the people over whom they put themselves in, responsibility, in, in authority. A contempt for everyone who says that they are masters of other people, not because those people have chosen them, but either through some superstition or most of all through wealth. The whole of his poetry is that. The Queen Mab, which is the poem that he wrote when he was 18, wrote between the ages of 18 and 19, the whole of that poem bursts with rage and fury at all the drones, the people who operated, the liars of the society, the psychophants, the parasites, the people who were in charge. You can't help but read it. I can't read these things out to you in full. I'd like one day to have a meeting of about eight or nine hours in which all these things can be read out in full. But the whole purpose of this meeting is to get you to go back and get hold of the Queen Mab and read particularly the central cantos. It's the story of a, 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 a young woman asleep and a, a, a fairy coming from above, a great spirit, coming and taking her and letting her look upon the world. They're taking her right up into the stratosphere and looking now down upon the world and seeing all the things that go on, all the kings and priests and statesmen and all the pomp and parasites that operate there. It really bursts out. The whole of his poetry bursts out with that rage all the way through his life. Couldn't stand that idea of that authority. There is the greatest poem of all, the, the Mask of Anarchy, uh, the poem that he wrote about the, uh, the massacre in Peterloo in 1819, when uh, trade unionists meeting in the fields outside Manchester were mown down by the yeomanry at the orders of the local magistracy. And Shelley wrote there, really he wrote, about the Tory government that was operating at that time about Castlereagh, the Foreign Secretary, about Sidmouth, the Home Secretary, about Eldon, the Lord Chancellor. He wrote about these people in language which is so furious and so simple that it comes all the way down through the ages. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be in admirable plight. For one by one and two by two, he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. Next came fraud, and he had on, like Eldon, an ermine gown. His big tears, for he wept well, turned to millstones when they fell. And the little children, who round his feet played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains knocked out by them clothed with a Bible as with light and the shadows of the night, like Sidmouth next, hypocrisy on a crocodile rode by. And many more destructions played in this ghastly masquerade, all disguised, even to the eyes, like bishops, lawyers, peers, and spies. He hated the whole damn lot of them, every single one of them that fell into any one of those categories, or any other categories which are parasitical, in one way or another, upon the working people. He loathed and hated them, and the whole of his, uh, the whole of his uh, 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 poetry reeks with that hatred. But the point, other point is this, that it wasn't just a hatred of authority. It was an understanding of the reasons for that authority, of the central cause of that authority. He wrote in the uh, introduction to a uh, pamphlet, perhaps I should say, in, uh, in 1815, I think it was, there, were, there was what's known, uh, 1817, sorry, the Derbyshire Trials. Those of you that read the great book by Edward Thompson, The Making of the English Working Class, will get there a very clear outline of the trials that took place of those Derbyshire workers. Thompson describes it as the first, really, first real sign in Britain of proletarian insurrection, Derbyshire workers which came together to react, to fight against the oppression that was landed on them by the government. And they took three as a result of the spying system, Oliver the Spy, the story of Oliver the Spy, they took three of them and hanged them. And on the day that they hanged them, Princess Charlotte, from the court, died. And the whole world, the woman magazine, uh, woman's own, uh, woman's journal, all these papers, organs of uh, influence in, in, uh, uh, among the bourgeoisie at the time, wept tremendous tears for Princess Charlotte. And Shelley wrote, Shelley wrote an essay, a really magnificent essay, comparing the death of Princess Charlotte on the one hand and the death of the, of the, uh, of the um, Derbyshire 
insurrectionists on the other. And in the introduction to that, you get, this is just an example of it, because it comes all the way through his poetry and all the way through his writings, an understanding of where, what the cause is for that authority, what the central cause of that authority and that tyranny was. The labourer, he that tills the ground and manufactures cloth, is the man who has to provide out of what he would bring home to his wife and children for the luxuries and comforts of those whose claims are represented by an annuity of 44 millions a year levied upon the English nation. Before, he supported the army and the pensioners and the royal family and the landholders. Many and various are the mischiefs flowing from oppression, but this is the representative of them all, namely that one man is forced to labour for another, in a degree not only necessary to the support of the subsisting distinctions among mankind, but so as by the excess of the injustice to endanger the very foundations of all that is valuable in social order, and to provoke that anarchy which is at once the enemy of freedom and the child and the chastiser of misrule. He saw it all the way through, all the way through Queen Mab, all the way through the Mask of Anarchy, all the way through the Revolt of Islam, all the way through those poems, these introductions, the great pamphlets and uh, prose writings that he wrote, all, those, all the way through is the exploitation, the fact that man feeds on man, the fact that it's not just authority over, but authority takes its, takes its sustenance from the exploitation, from the wealth that is robbed from one section to the other. And again, I wish I could read all the different uh, examples in which he demonstrates how that is the central uh, cause of the operation, how that it's, 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 it is the, 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 the exploitation. The other thing that's different between Shelley and a whole number of other people that operated at that time and a whole number of other people that operate today who understand about authority and who understand about the need, the, the, the cause of the authority, the exploitation, is that he wanted to do something about it. He got a lot of his inspiration from a man called William Godwin, who was a, 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 a writer of considerable note, who wrote a book called Political Justice, which in many ways was quite a revolutionary work. It talked about equality, it talked about the exploitation that was going on in the society. But the, 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 the point about God, why wasn't Godwin prosecuted, that's one of the questions that was asked, because anyone that was challenging authority at that time, was almost everyone, was prosecuted. Godwin wasn't prosecuted for a very simple reason. But the Prime Minister Pitt, when it was put to him that Godwin should be uh, prosecuted, asked how much political justice was. And he was told that it was six guineas. And when he was told that it was six guineas, he said there's no point in prosecuting, because nobody who matters, from our point of view, is going to read it. In other words, it was a, a bourgeois work, a work written for the bourgeoisie, not directed to any other operation at all. And when Shelley was in Ireland, protesting and trying to get association of people in Ireland to protest against a, a British oppression in Ireland, he and Godwin had a correspondence which most of all underlines what the difference between them was. Godwin said, you must explain these ideas, you must come and tell people what these ideas are about, you have to just always tell people, inform people, do it from the fireside, do it gently, do it with people of uh, intelligence, people who understand things, do it that way. Whatever you do, don't talk about associations, don't talk about parties, don't talk about these things at all, because doing that, uh, you will land up in violence, Shelley, you are preparing a scene of blood, he said, writing to Shelley uh, when Shelley was in Ireland. And Shelley wrote back, and I think, I think this, I can find it, I'm very shortly now, I'm going to run out of the ability to find things. <laughs> Shelley wrote back this. A proponent, I certainly believe, sorry, will truth alone convert the world without generous advocates of the truth united to press its claims upon an unheeding generation? It is nearly 20 years since political justice was first published. What has followed? Have men ceased to fight? Have night, vice and misery vanished from the earth? Have the fireside communications which it recommends taken place? I think of the last 20 years with impatient scepticism as to the progress which the human mind has made during this period. I will own that I am eager that something should be done. That also is central to his ideas. In the Queen Mab he writes this, and he writes, I think, directly to Godwin. You can get it out of that inspiration of that kind of reference when he makes about the fireside communications. You see, uh, uh, you see what he means. The man of ease, who by his warm fireside to deeds of charitable intercourse and their fulfilment of the common laws of decency and prejudice confines the struggling nature of his human heart, is duped by their cold sophistry. He sheds a passing tear perchance upon the wreck of earthly peace, when near his dwelling's door the frightful waves are driven, when his son is murdered by the tyrant, or religion drives his wife raving mad. But the poor man, 
whose life is misery and fear and care, whom the morn wakens but the fruitless toil, whoever hears his famished offspring scream, whom their pale mother's uncomplaining gaze forever meets, and the proud rich man's eye flashing command, and the heartbreaking scene of thousands like himself, he little heeds the rhetoric of tyranny, his hate is quenchless as his wrongs, he laughs the scorn, the vain and bitter mockery of words, feeling the horror of the tyrant's deeds, and unrestrained but by the arm of power that knows and dreads his enmity. He could see there clearly the difference between the reformism, exactly the reformism, of Godwin sitting there by the fireside, churning out the six guinea works, which people could discuss uh, at uh, uh, fashionable soirees, and what the hatred, the anger, the unquenchable fury of working people who had nothing to, to, to beat them down, save the power of the, of the ruling forces at that time. He understood not only the exploitation, but he understood the need to do something about it, and he also understood that the will to do something about it can only really come in the end from the people who are most oppressed. And then he came, and all his poetry came, not just to the problem of exploitation, and the problem of tyranny, and the problem of how you have to do something about that tyranny, but he applied himself all the time, and perhaps all the way through this, of course, there are lessons for us, all the way through, he applied himself to the ideas which underpinned the tyranny. He could see, just as we can see, that the tyranny that exists in the society doesn't sustain itself by proclaiming itself. It doesn't say, we are profiteers, we are exploiters, we are speculators, we love to speculate in the masses. What you have to do, you masses, is to agree to be speculated by us, and profiteered, and lynched, and uh, stoned, and robbed by us, and looted. We're looters, you're the looted, and really, let's carry on like that. That's a very fair form of society. That's not how society sustained itself at all. That's not how authority sustained itself. It sustained itself with a whole number of different ideas, which it imposes through its media, through the people who write and talk, uh, for authority, imposes those ideas, gets those ideas current within the people that it's trying to oppress, and thereby, thereby finds oppression much easier. And Shelley took a number of these ideas and dealt with them, all the way through his poetry. First of them, perhaps, was the, uh, the idea of God, the idea of religion. Perhaps not quite so central now to us, in terms of holding people back from tyranny, but then absolutely fundamental. As I say, the very first essay that was ever published uh, against religion, against organized and established religion in this country was the necessity of atheism. And when I say published, I mean that Shelley uh, used his father's funds, which uh, were not given for that purpose, I can assure you, used his father's funds to publish just a few documents and distribute them to the bishops of Oxford. That's the level to which that got published. But he understood that if people talk about God, and take their command from a supernatural power, and believe somehow that there is another world that they can go to, and any rewards uh, that exist in society exist not in this world but in another world, then that paves the way for authority and tyranny. That is a, 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 an opening for people to be able to say, nothing you can do about it, absolutely nothing you can do about it, all you have to do is believe. Men say they have seen God, and heard from God, or known from others who have known such things and that his will is all our law, a rod to scourge us into slaves, the priests and kings, custom, domestic sway, I, all that brings man's free-born soul beneath the oppressor's heel, are his strong ministers, and that the stings of death will make the wise his vengeance feel, though truth and virtue arm their hearts with tenfold steel. All the way through the attack on religion, on God, the proclamation of atheism censored from the end of the revolt of Islam, where the people there, as they come up to be finally chained and burnt to death by the authorities, shout that they want to show how atheists and republicans can die, and that was cut and carved up and said how libertarians and people who like liberty can die for about 150 years after he wrote it. But those ideas, again, against God, against religion, are central to it. All the way through Queen Mab again is that attack upon the priests, the people that uh, come uh, uh, in the name of God and in the name of some supernatural power come outside and get rich and fat as a result of other people not noticing that they're getting rich and fat on the basis of a philosophy based on the supernatural. And then I think perhaps the greatest uh, uh, area, in this area, in the area of the ideas that underpin the, uh, the uh, uh, tyranny that existed then, was Shelley's uh, attitude to women. See, uh, it, it wasn't just that he noticed uh, and saw all around him 
that half the human race were held in a particular form of tyranny, a particular form of contempt. It wasn't just that he could see what, uh, what was the result of that kind of domestic tyranny, not only in the upper circles of society, but all the way through the society. Not just that he wrote these very, very famous lines, Can man be free if woman be a slave? Shame one who lives and breathes this boundless air for the corruption of a closed grave. Can they whose mates are beasts condemned to bear scorn heavier far than toil or anguish dare to trample their oppressors? In their home among their babes thou knowest a curse would wear the shape of woman. Hoary crime would come behind and fraud rebuild religion's tottering dome. Not just that he, he saw that the women were the women were oppressed in the society, that the women were oppressed in the home. It's not just that he saw the monstrosity of that. It's not even just that he saw that there was no prospect whatever of any kind of revolutionary upsurge if men left women behind, like in the 1848 rebellions in Paris where the men deliberately locked the women up and told them they couldn't come out on the demonstrations and the, and the battles that took place there because in some way or other that would demean the nature of the revolution. It wasn't just that he saw the absurdity of that which was to happen 30 or 40 years after he wrote all this stuff about women, but that he saw that what happened when women did activate themselves and did start to take control of their lives and did start to hit back against oppression, what happened then was that again and again they seized the leadership of the forces that were in revolution. You see that all through Shelley's poetry, all his great revolutionary poems, the main agitators, the people that do most of the revolutionary work, most of the revolutionary speeches are women. Queen Mab herself, the Asia in Prometheus, uh, Iona in Swordfoot, Sintha, most important of all, Sintha in the revolt of Islam. All these women, throughout his poetry, were the leaders of the revolution, the main agitators, the people that went all the time. The person who says that thing there, can man be free if woman be a slave, is Sintha in the revolt of Islam, taken by the sailors, captive, and then going and speaking to the sailors who held her captive, and calling on them to free her and the other prisoners, and join with the revolution. This need not be. Ye can arise and will that gold should lose its power and thrones its glory. And that comes from a woman. And he understood just as we had better understand, and we better understand it fast, because it's a prejudice that goes back deeper than any other prejudice that exists in the society today, we'd better understand that point. But when the women start to take control, it's not just a question of understanding oppression, paying lip service to the oppression, but the possibility there not only of taking part, of sharing in the revolutionary upheaval, but actually of leading it, that I think is one of the most inspiring parts of, uh, of Shelley's poetry. And it follows from that, that when these people talk, the Horsham's, the... Uh, the lords and ladies of literature throughout the ages of Shelley, the Rossetti circle in the 1880s, or perhaps uh, one or two people might object to my being a bit cynical about that, sitting and reading their Shelley over the fireside, about how Shelley was concerned with love. Uh, a wonderful thing, love, particularly for Victorian gentlemen. <laughs> it was a thing, a relationship between men and women which is founded upon prettiness and obsequiousness and fawning and being looking after your man and seeing that he has all the things that he needs and living your life through your man that was really what love meant to the people that read Shelley for themselves in the 1880s and 18. I they could pick out the pieces little bits of love poetry and Shelley was pretty guilty of it you know they castigated as love poetry. What are all these kisses worth if thou kiss not me? They used to read this to one another. And uh, really, it was, really it was no more than just seductive poetry of the worst kind, if you want to know. But they used to read it and say, yes, Shelley was very interested in love. He was interested in that kind of love. He was interested in and people wooing, young men wooing their young women in high society at that time always used to have a little copy of Shelley's love poems she to be censored which they would perhaps read in the moonlight to one another in a romantic kind of way and because of course she did write marvellous love poetry not just that kind of dribble that I just quoted but a whole number of very very marvellous love poetries including some of the 
descriptions of the sex act, which I, in my view are some of the greatest ever written, they used to read these kind of things to each other and titillate themselves and, uh, uh, and uh, propose after the right kind of poetry uh, had been, uh, uh, had been uh, said to one another. All that kind of thing, this is the most intolerable thing of all, because the one thing that he did stand for worked more than anything else, and he did write a great deal about the relationship between men and women, and not only the relationship between men and women, but the relationship between men and men, and women and women, and men and women and children, and the relationship relationship between human beings in general, the one thing that he understood perhaps more than anything and drove home more than anything is that what is central to any real love, any real affection, any real respect between human beings is the lack of constraint. All the way through. That runs all the way through his poetry. I, it, you have to, it's not just Queen Mab, it's not just the poem which is magnificent, it's the notes to the poem. The notes to the poem, I tell you, I read the notes to the poem when I was 37, and I spent the first two hours after reading them, dreaming around the place thinking it was absolutely fantastic, and the next two years since I read them, wondering why the bloody hell I'd never read them before. Absolutely appalling. Most of you have got the opportunity of reading them before you're 37, you missed the opportunity, it's the most appalling thing you've ever done. I just want to... <laughs> the present system of constraint does no more in the majority of instances than make hypocrites or open enemies persons of delicacy and virtue unhappily united to one whom they find it impossible to love spend the loveliest season of their life in unproductive efforts to appear otherwise than they are for the sake of the feelings of their partner or the welfare of their mutual offspring those of less generosity and refinement openly avow their disappointment and linger out the remnants of that union which only death can dissolve in a state of incurable bickering and hostility. The early education of their children takes its colour from the squabbles of the parents. They are nursed in a systematic school of ill humour, violence and falsehood. Had they been suffered to part at the moment when indifference rendered their union irksome, they would have been spared many years of misery. They would have connected themselves more suitably, and would have found that happiness in the society of more congenial partners, which is forever denied them by the despotism of marriage. They would have been separately useful and happy members of society, who, whilst united, were miserable and rendered misanthropical by misery. The conviction that wedlock is indissoluble holds out the strongest of all temptations to the perverse. They indulge without restraint in acrimony and all the little tyrannies of domestic life when they know that their victim is without appeal. If this connection were put on a rational basis, each would be assured and the habitual ill temper would terminate in separation and would check this vicious and dangerous propensity. I can't tell you what kind of subversion that was when it was written. I can't tell you the utter horror that ran through the minds of the people who wrote in the New Statesmen and the Spectators and the Couriers and all the people of that time when they read that kind of thing. They felt the whole foundation of the miserable potentates which they were making themselves in their domestic world was being undermined by that kind of writing. All the way through, there's three or four pages of it, talking about the indissolubility, the constraints, the economic constraints, the domestic constraints, that exist in society and therefore trap love, make it impossible to any kind of real relationship between human beings of any description to exist whatever because of the constraints which existed upon it. And of all the insults which are put out against Shelley over all these years, there is none to touch that one, that, the, uh, that, that love, is, uh, that he wrote about love, as though it fitted with the Victorian idea of love, the idea that comes out of a society which depends upon potentates potentates at the top and potentates all the way through, little despots and dictators all the way down from top to bottom, that idea, it cannot exist, no relationship exists in that society and nothing comes clearer from Shelley's poetry and his prose than that. And I just say this, just in case anyone thinks at any stage that I'm doing a Dowden on Shelley, that I think that he was a saint or uh, a marvellous creature, that he himself in his, uh, in his own life, or for that matter even in his writings, was blameless. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, that little bit of dribble and doggerel that I quoted earlier about the kisses and the seduction, that runs through not only a lot of his poetry, but also through a lot of his life. And I think from time to time, the fellow was prepared to uh, uh, help himself. He wasn't prepared to, easy, easy enough to say, the answer is separation, but the problem is, do both want to be separated? That often 
is the problem, and he didn't always apply his mind to that in the terms of the equality of people in which he spoke. And therefore I think that uh, uh, when you look at his life and the way he lived his life, there is none of the uh, uh, perfection and the, the uh, uh, stringency really of the idea, or well, there's some of it that not, certainly doesn't live up to it, but the point really is this, that the poetry and the writing, the things that he believed in, were there, there as a guide and a marker as to how people should determine their lives and how people could determine their lives if society wasn't founded on restraint right the way through the society, all those different economic restraints and domestic constraints that exist. And then people say, and they say it often with a lot of justification, that here all this talk about this great revolutionary poet doesn't fit a lot of the facts it doesn't fit a lot of the things that Shelley wrote about and how Shelley wrote. There were many, many aspects of Shelley's writing which appear to us to be quite crudely reformist, revisionist, if you want to use that kind of language, or even uh, uh, elitist, if you want to use that kind of language. That uh, there's a whole number of things that he wrote which uh, indicate a rather different kind of uh, 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 language to the language that I'm describing here. Can I find it? That is the main question. In the, uh, in the notes to the Prometheus, the notes about the Prometheus, he wrote, truth is I can't find it, but uh, what he wrote about there was that he wanted to write, he wrote in this thing, he said, he got, he, he's interested in reform and change, and he wants to change the society, and he wants to write uh, 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 for uh, an educated and intelligent group of people so that they can understand it. There's a whole lot of his writing which talks about the dangers of the mob, the dangers of doing things too fast, this pamphlet that I mentioned earlier, the philosophical view of reform, or there's another one very similar to it, which he wrote in 1817, called A Proposal for Putting Reform to the Vote, as a matter of fact comes out against universal suffrage, against the thing which many reformers, and many reformers much more, less revolutionary in my idea than Shelley was, were of course advocating at that time. Comes out against universal suffrage on the ground, and he says it, that we don't want to move too fast, we can't be quite sure about the mob, what the mob will do, if they will they're not, they're not educated people, they're not uh, intelligent or sensitive people, and they might make nonsense of universal suffrage, and therefore we ought to be careful about it. And it's no good uh, uh, talking about Shelley in an idealistic or utopian manner, a hagi or hagiography, writing about the man as though he, everything that he said absolutely fitted into the, uh, uh, into the uh, what would have been the uh, uh, proper SWP line at the time. It doesn't, and a lot of things go right against the kind of things that I've been talking to. And I say... When explaining that and trying to de deal with it and trying to understand how such clearly contradictory ideas, there he is talking in the notes to Prometheus about that, opposing universal suffrage uh, uh, again, you also see uh, um, a quite different, well, put it this way, do it like this. So a number of people, and particularly people who come to revolutionary ideas out of the ruling classes, a species of which I have some uh, familiarity, uh, and uh, uh, people who are um, uh, 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 come out of there and come to the ideas, particularly Shelley was all his life, or most of his life, very much isolated from the working people about whom he wrote and for whom he felt, and for whom he wanted to change the world, or he wanted the world to be changed, or whom he wanted to change the world, whichever way you want to look at it, there is a feeling among some people, such people, according to the degree, the degree to which they're isolated from those people, from those people that they want to change the world, there is a feeling of uh, fear of the mob. I don't know, there may be, uh, maybe one or two people here that have not read uh, a novel by George Eliot called Felix Holt. Now, that's rather like... Uh, um, boiled. Some people have boiled, and some people have piles, and that's very unfortunate. Some people haven't read Felix Holt, and that's very unfortunate. The only thing is, you can put that right, you know, you can, you can read it, and uh, then you don't have to tell anyone that you haven't read it uh, before, you know, you can read it and then pretend you read it ten years ago, as <laughs> most of you should have done, because that's a, a marvellous novel, wonderful, radical novel, the Felix Holt the Radical, it's about a, a man who is perhaps the nicest man ever written about in the whole of literature. You can't help reading Felix Holt without feeling a fantastic affection towards him. He was lovely, everybody loved him, he wanted to change the world, he wanted to be with the workers, he didn't like all the hypocrisy of the society, he was wonderful. But there was one thing about him which was also one thing about George Eliot, and that was his fear of the mob. Uncertainty of 
unleashing them all. Uncertainty, just like Sherry is in that, uh, in that uh, pamphlet there. Uncertainty about universal suffrage, debates with his father-in-law about universal suffrage, his father-in-law being a Methodist minister, being in favour of universal suffrage, and Felix Holt the Radical not being too sure because of the mob and all the rest of it. And therefore you see, for instance, the, the nightmare, what's the traditional nightmare of the bourgeois novelist or poet, or for that matter, uh, the average Labour MP or anyone you want to think about, is the mob in action. You see in Felix Holt, uh, suddenly he's sitting there thinking about his ideas and they say, oh, there's an election, there's a riot. Oh my God, there's a riot. And he leaps on to keep the people in, in check, to talk to them about what they have to do, from other people are stampeding, going down, demanding, picketing, kicking Clive Jenkins in the balls, all that kind of thing, <laughs> shouting down Albert Boone, all these things are happening. And he's saying, for God's sake, watch it, don't do it. The mob, you know, you can't do this. And he's standing there and here come the yeomanry, shoot him because they think he's the leader and shoot him through the shoulder. <laughs> That's the terror of everyone, every bourgeois radical. That's the dream that they have. They wake up sweating in the night. All the Labour MPs, all the reformers, they wake up, my God, if we unleash the mob by what we're doing, Shelley, you're preparing a scene of blood. Remember what Godwin said, perhaps that's what's going to happen. The mob, we've got to watch out for the mob. The mob aren't intelligent, they haven't come to the idea. All those prejudices sunk into the ruling class mind. That sensitive, intelligent, ruling class mind that doesn't go along with his class ideology, but then they come to some other ideology, some kind of reforming or radical ideology, and finds he's worried about what he unleashes. There people read Felix Holt, the whole blow, 40 years, nice, radical, bourgeois people, read George Eliot, read Felix Holt, and they have oh, oh, the, the nightmare of that mob, that election riot, being shot through the shoulder, and then put in prison, by the way, for leading the riot in the first place. That's what happened. And that is in Shelley, son of Shelley. People aren't, they aren't perfect and they don't have ideas which are pure and there's some part of him all the time forging its way out here and there in some of his poems. You know, there's a thing in the Mask of Anarchy where he says the answer is to fold your arms when the yeomanry come next time. He's talking to people that have been burned down at Peterloo, you know, people that have been women and children murdered at Peterloo. He says next time. Hold your arms resolutely, thinking of the laws of England, the good old laws of England. Stand there and talk about the law of England and all of them, and just stand there and let them mow you down, and then maybe it'll be all right. Whatever you do, don't unleash yourself. There's that part of him, there's this is another part of him. There's the other part of him, the part of him that I've talked about already. The part of him that says, yes, you've got to get them. You've got to move and get them. And there's a two part of him constantly coming out. He wrote a whole series of letters to a woman called Elizabeth Hitchener when he was a young man and he had this uh, uh, long uh, correspondence. So i just read out one section of it, but this is just typical of how you see the other side, the other side to that side, that reformist, if you like, that slow, that worrying side about the mob. There was another side to him as well. They may feed and may riot and may sin to the last moment. The groans of the wretched may pass unheeded till the latest moment of this infamous revelry till the storm burst upon them and the oppressed take ruinous vengeance on their oppressors. Ruinous vengeance? What the hell is that? That Felix Holt down the last. That's exactly what he's saying he shouldn't do in all the other writings. Uh, the, 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 uh, in the, in the, the book uh, Swellfoot the Tyrant, wonderful poem, you know, Swellfoot the Tyrant, oh, to sneer that by all these people, oh my God, watch out for that, you know, it's not very funny anyway. <laughs> not very funny, you know. Well, you don't think this is very funny, really. What he has there uh, is a lot of pigs who are, the, who are the people, the pigs, all uh, snorting away and doing everything that they're told, and then suddenly the pigs turn into people, and the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, all the oppressors, all the priests and uh, parasites and speculators and industrialists and people of that kind, commercialists, turn into pigs, the, people turn, the pigs turn into people, and the, 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 the parasites turn into pigs, and then he has a fantastic scene at the end of the poem, which he says, hey, drive them out! Pierce them down, put them down. You know, all this talk, he says, oh, you must never take people's lives, and uh, you must never really uh, be, uh, you must watch out, you mustn't be uh, retributionist, you mustn't see for revenge. Yeah, but absolutely, he goes completely over the score now. He's going ultra left in his attitude to, the, to what they should do there. When he hears pigs get up, drive them out, pin them down, stick them in the back, anything, get them. He then he sees the fury when he's act activated, really by the fury of what's going on around him, you have a quite different uh, attitude to it. And really, the Prometheus unbound. You see, it comes to a climax, this division, this, this 
contrast between the way in which he thought about revolutions and oppressions and the mob, all these things come to a climax, the contradiction comes to a climax when he writes the Prometheus Unbound. Now that's a very difficult poem to read. I lot of people come up to me since we had the meeting at Skegness last year and so on, and they say, well I tried to read this Prometheus Unbound, it's very difficult to read, and so it is. Very difficult to read. But the, 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 the most important thing about it, in my view, is that it brings that contradiction between his attitude to the law to the head and forces it through to some kind of conclusion. I mean, this is the story of Prometheus. I was a Greek scholar, admit it. I was a Greek scholar at school. I was very, very good at Greek. Uh, in order to be, not to be good at anything else. And uh, I wasn't actually all that good. But at any rate, I was a Greek scholar. And we were taught about Prometheus. I don't know, the Greek legend. The Greek legend of Prometheus is simply this that uh, there was a, a, a man who dared to say that Jupiter was not to be the god of the earth. An absolutely scandal. I mean, we would really, <laughs> we were really described as a really revolting, subversive figure, you know, who was treated in the way in which subversive figures ought to be treated. He defied Jupiter, he dared to invent fire, he had the idea that science might advance the cause of mankind instead of advancing the cause of Jupiter. Uh, uh, science on the whole, Jupiter's view was that science was really rather a radical idea in the first place. It was better without science of any kind in order that the rule of Jupiter can be more uh, 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 safer. And therefore, uh, 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 Prometheus uh, disobeyed Jupiter, invented fire, had this idea about science, and he was treated in the way in which all naughty public schoolboys ought to be treated, which was that he was chained to a rock for <laughs> seven million years, uh, uh, and every evening and every morning uh, a, a vulture came and gnawed out his liver, uh, which would grow again by the following morning or evening, and then the vulture would come again and gnaw it out, and it was extremely painful, and they're looking into these practices, I understand, the Brazilian police and uh, <laughs> the uh, Turkish authorities in Cyprus, are looking into this as a new form of dealing with recalcitrance of one kind or another, and really the whole thing was talk to us that way. That was written, as a matter of fact, by a man called Aeschylus, Prometheus Bound and Prometheus Unbound, who did have an idea about uh, people rebelling against authority. We were not taught that. I read the whole bloody thing in Greek and never came to that conclusion, or never even started to come to that conclusion. But at any rate, there we are. There's a man in revolt. He's in revolt against authority, and he's chained to the rock. Shelley writes a poem about this man chained to the rock, and his lover, Asia, uh, is, uh, seeks to get him off the rock. He represents chained man, uh, oppressed mankind. He represents oppressed mankind. His lover, love militant Richard Holmes, the only book, the only book worth reading on the subject, Richard Holmes describes as love militant, not just in love. Oh, my man is, uh, oh, he's, oh, he's chained to the rock. Oh, gee, I mean, get him out of there, that's the point. How the hell do you get him out of there? What do you do to get him out of that situation? And then it's very interesting the way in which they write about it, because there's another character in this play, in this play poem, it's a play poem, one of the most, not, probably some of the most beautiful poetry ever written in the whole history of English literature, but you have there uh, uh, um, uh, uh, another, another character in it. And it's very, very interesting, this other character, is, is, a man, is something called Demogorgon. Demogorgon, you read, read all these books, you look him up, but they don't even have an index most of the time, and Demogorgon, they don't really discuss it. Who is this Demogorgon? He's a spirit. Um, he's a, he's a, some kind of weird thing that Asia goes to appeal to to get Prometheus out. You see, the, the man's in trouble, and she goes, in the same way that people go to an altar, or to some deity and say, now can you help me? Now the thing is, this is the Greek actually does come to, in, in some assistance here. Because Demogorgon, as I understand it, and as Richard Holmes understands it, and as no one else has yet understood it, right? <laughs> Demogorgon is, comes from two words in Greek. Demos, that is the people, and Gorgon, the monster. The people monster. Now she, when she goes to get him out, she goes to the people monster. She goes down there, act two, scene four of Prometheus, one of the most fantastic things in the whole section. I've got to find this, even if it takes me half an hour to find it. <laughs> Bloody well, I've got to find this. It is, act one is extremely difficult to read, and I don't uh, blame anyone who doesn't read it. And if I were you, I would go straight to act two, scene four. <laughs> The cave of Demogorgon. Enter Asia and Panthea. These are the people that operate. They go down into this cave. What veiled form sits on, on that Eben throne? Asia, the veil has fallen. 
County I see a mighty darkness filling with seat of power, and rays of bloom dart round as light from the brilliant sun, ungazed upon and shapeless, neither limb nor form nor outline, yet we feel it is a living spirit. Demogorgon comes to speak. Ask what thou wouldst know. Now what you have now, coming on now, is what we're doing all the time. It's a piece of agitation. It's a piece of quite simple agitation. No good under, how the hell anybody reads this without understanding that this is the people, this is the monster of the people, something human, that can release the dreadful situation that both Asia and Prometheus are in. Asia, what canst thou tell? Theme of all gone. Unless you could imagine this going on in any factory. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 what, what, what canst thou tell? Theme of all gone. All things thou darest to mark. everything. <laughs> Who made the living world? Theme of all God. What causes the crisis? Uh, <laughs> Reds. Uh, you know, uh, well, countries in a mess. Who made all that it contains? Thought, passion, reason, will, imagination. God, almighty God. Yes, it's a reasonable responsible. Create a wages causing the economic crisis. That's what's happening. Who made that sense which when the winds of spring in rarest visitation or the voice of one beloved heard in youth alone fills the faint eyes with falling tears which dim the radiant looks of unbewailing flowers and leaves this peopled earth of solitude when it returns no more. He was all gone. Merchant all gone. <laughs> and who made terror, madness, crime, remorse which from the links of the great chain of things to every thought within the mind of man sway and drag heavily and each one reels under the load towards the pit of death abandoned hope and love that turns to hate and self-contempt bitterer to drink than blood pain whose unheeding and familiar speech is howling and keen shrieks day after day and hell all the sharp fear of hell theme of all he reigns utter his name a world pining in pain asks for his name Curses shall drag him down. And she whips him with the agitation, whips him with it. Ask the simple question first, is it God who's done it? Well, what about all the dirty things that are going on? What are you going to do about that? All the way through this passage, whipping him with the agitation, long spells and short spells. Whom calls thou God? I spoke, but as you speak, the Jones is the supreme of living beings. Who is the master of the slave? Asking the question, who is the master of the slave? And on and on and on until she says, Prometheus shall arise, henceforth the son of this rejoicing world. When shall the destined hour arise? Behold, and now, when you talk about what happens after that agitation, constant agitation, come on, come to the ideas, come out of your old religious superstitions, all your backward ideas, your racialist ideas, and so on, come out of them. What happens then? What can happen? Now then there is imagery. What happens? Behold then, what happens? Is that two cars emerge out of a cave. Two cars representing change, representing the powers that are going to go up to Jupiter and deal with him. In one way or another, they're going to deal with him. Well, I'm going to read it out and leave that for you to read. What I will read is Richard Holmes's description of what those two cars mean, what they represent. And here is the, the synthesis, if you like, coming to grips with the problems that he had there all his life about the masses. Would the masses respond? What would happen if they did? What was the problem of the mob? All these things. There are two chariots mentioned. The one that brings Demogorgon to Jupiter is undoubtedly terrible and violent. Jupiter, authoritarian government, is to be overwhelmed by massive force and the process in society is to be like a volcanic eruption and an earthquake which ruins cities. The etymological reading is surely relevant here. It is the eruption of Demogorgon, the people monster. Yet there is also the second chariot with its delicate, strange tracery and its gentle charioteer with dove-like eyes of hope. This is the chariot which carries Asia and Panthea back to Prometheus. And it seems to indicate that political freedom transforms man's own nature and substitutes an ethic of love for the ideology of revenge and destruction represented by Prometheus' curse. The end of Act Two leaves both those possibilities open historically. Revolution will come, but how it will come depends on man himself. There are always two chariots in either case it is inevitable and it is to be celebrated. Now, we don't say that it's inevitable, but the point is this, that in either case, the synthesis there, the dialectic, if you like, of the argument about the mob, 
that the mob might uh, go supersede itself is really met in that great passage there. That really, for every, oh, they all say it's the greatest passage ever. Does anybody understand what it's about? They don't understand what's going on in his head because they've separated the man from his ideas. They don't understand what the imagery is about. It's very beautiful, yes. You learn that off by heart and shut up if you ask any questions. People have all gone very interesting. He's rather like uh, 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 Mary, the mother of Joseph, and so on. That's the sort of person he is, and they unleash all kinds of wonderful things. But the fact of the matter is that you do have a synthesis there, coming out of the dialectic of the argument. And the, the fact of the matter is you can have civil war, bloody revolution, you can have all kinds of violence on the one hand when you rise up, or you can have it done if you're strong enough, if you're more, so powerful and forceful that you're strong enough to do it by cutting down the amount of violence, you can have it done with that gentle wide-eyed charioteer. Either way, probably, probably if the truth be known, it'll be a mixture of both, but either way it is to be celebrated. Either way, it has to be supported. And the point about Shelley is this. But although there's all that literature, all those examples of writing to uh, individuals, to elites, to people that aren't going to do the job, uh, to, to people that aren't going to be able to do the job, although there is all that, there is that conclusive proof that whenever he came to test the two ideas, he came out on that side. Well, there is no evidence at all. You read, for instance, Stephen Spender. Oh, yeah. Stephen Spender, you know, old Stalinist hack, you know, the 30s, who came out, even, couldn't even bear to be a Stalinist, had given that up, and had just sort of dribbling on in the Times Literary Supplement and so on. And he writes, you know, oh, there's a lot of proof, there's a lot of proof that Shelley, at the end of his life, you know, he started to give, to give up and uh, give up the uh, revolutionary ideas that he had before, and, and really, uh, uh, he, quite now, that is not what happened at all. That poem is written right at the end of his life. All the great poems of 1819, from the Mask of Anarchy, those shorter poems, one that starts off, an old, mad, blind, despised and dying king. That's not the line of a man who's giving up the struggle. Uh, uh, real attacks on that castle ray administration, all that comes right at the end of his life. Those things happen there, and the people that understand Shelley understand that he would have gone on to develop. The tragedy was that he did die when he did. He'd gone on to develop that idea among the rising working class movement that was taking place. One person who understands it man called Karl Marx, who was writing at the same time as all these dribblers were mucking about in Horsham. Or <laughs> <laughs> a little earlier at any rate. And this is the, uh, this is the Franz Mehring uh, biography of Marx. And Marx, as I think one thing that did come out of that dreadful series on Eleanor Marx that was on the television recently. One thing that came out, one or two tiny little scraps of information and importance came out. One thing was that Marx and his family were great lovers of literature and great lovers of English literature and weren't people who looked back on literature in the way in which some sectarian people do, as though it was something all belonging to the bourgeois part <coughs> and that all literature starts from the revolution. He was someone who looked back and notified and reveled in the great literature that had taken place before. <laughs> After Marx had become permanently domiciled in London, English literature took first place and the tremendous figure of Shakespeare dominated the field. In fact, the whole family practiced what amounted to a Shakespearean cult. Unfortunately, Marx never at any time dealt with Shakespeare's attitude to the great questions of his day. Referring to Byron and Shelley, however, he declared that those who loved and understood those two poets must consider it fortunate that Byron died at the age of 36, for had he lived out his full span, he would undoubtedly have become a reactionary bourgeois. Whilst regretting, on the other hand, that Shelley died at the age of 29, for Shelley was a thorough revolutionary and would have remained in the van of socialism all his life. He did, although dead remain in the van of socialism all his life. Uh, the greatness of that book by Richard Holmes is that it traces this other Shelley, that revolutionary Shelley, that Shelley that would have remained in the van of socialism all his life. It traces that Shelley through the uh, years that followed Shelley's death. It traces him through the period of the Chartists, from 18... There's a book here. Uh, this book nicest book I've got, not on loan to anybody. This is a book of the, a publication of Queen Mab, which is dated 1871, and was published, without Shelley's permission, by a man called William Clark, who was one of the many people at that time that started to publish literature on the streets, on the stalls, 
outside the ordinary publishing houses without the necessary stamps and without the necessary government approval and sell things in millions. There's the Queen now. There wasn't a good band like that in those days. It was just a leaflet which was dished out. Between 18, uh, 1819 and 18, this was published in 1819, between 1821 rather, between 1821 and 1841, those 20 years, there were 14 separate editions of the Queen Mare, just the Queen Mare, published by working class publishers for working people. Sold, sometimes given away, but sold at very cheap prices in bookstores, in uh, places of work, and all around the place in the neighbourhoods and the working class areas where people live. No one can tell, of course, because this is a history which we can't, we haven't got enough of, but no one knows how many copies of sale. We know how many editions there were. These are just 14 editions that Richard Holmes has found, but there are many, many more, no doubt, than that. All these things, the Mask of Anarchy, the Address to Princess, the Address to the People on the Death of Princess Charlotte, all these wonderful works were published not by these bourgeois publishers, who on the, on the whole tried to keep Shelley's work for themselves, and instigated all kinds of prosecutions against the people that this fellow was hounded off the streets. He was prosecuted and sent to prison for three years for publishing this book. Richard Carlyle had published all of Shelley's works in his great work, The Republican, so copies of works that sold particularly in Ireland. Richard Carlyle spent years and years and years in Dorchester prison, still giving orders that these sorts of publications should be published. That tradition goes all the way through the 1830s. Through the 1840s, Thomas Cooper, the rhymer, the chartist rhymer, what they used to do because many people couldn't read. They used to go to workers' meetings and talk poetry and read out the Queen Mab and read out the Mask of Anarchy and read out the, uh, uh, the, the shorter poems of 1819, the Men of England and all the rest of them. They used to read those things out to people and people used to learn them and pass them on to their families and that's a tradition which is buried from the bourgeois publishers but it's a tradition which comes through that Bernard Shaw meeting in 1890 and right, right up to the early communist movement in the 1920s when Shelley again was a great favourite and I say the early communist movement in the 1920s because the later communist movement is not, uh, does not find Shelley a favourite. Here's the book. Here is a disgusting book <laughs> by a man called David Deitches, who is, I think, still the uh, professor of literature somewhere or other. But in the old days, in the good old days of the 1930s, when they produced, you know, this left book club, uh, 257 editions, quite a considerable feat, the publishing of it, except that so much of it is so much utter drivel. Uh, this is, a, I think, a response to what you might call the left labour uh, uh, communist tradition, how it is degenerated even by, I think this was published in 1938. In Cherry's poetry, he's continually stressing the inevitability of man's natural goodness, eventually destroying the bonds of his fate world. He thinks chiefly of the ideal rather than the means to its attainment. And though they profess this thinkers may look on him as a forerunner, he is in no way a political thinker in the modern sense. He has the outlook on life of a sensitive and intelligent child. He never faced the real problems of earthly existence, though on the other hand he never consciously retired into a dream world. That is why Shelley, for all his great lyrical faculty, is a poet whom we find sooner or later to be unsatisfied. This is a book on literature and society, and that is the passage devoted to Shelley by a tradition which had lost its, lost its lust for the uh, activity of the human beings, of real human beings operating, lost its enthusiasm and vigour in terms of the operation of matters of people, an intellectual position which had cut off, if you like, from the Thomas Coopers, from all those Carlyle, all the way through to that meeting in the East End of London, which those early communists, even people like Willie Gallagher, used to go around the Clyde shouting the poems of Shelley. Now you come to that and you find, I've even, oh, meant to bring it with me, but I lost it, a little review of Holmes' book in the Morning Star the other day, which is even more revolting than that uh, David Dyches, because they've lost the vigour and the enthusiasm which Shelley had for the people and for the movements which the people could throw up. And I, 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 that, that really, uh, it really, one moment, that really uh, brings us, uh, help. that really brings us to this meeting and uh, why we're in this meeting and the tradition really comes down to us, I think, it comes down to us, I think it is part of a, of, of a tradition of which, of, of, of which we are part. But I, I think I would just like to end up by saying one or two things about that tradition and about the importance of, uh, of that tradition and why it's important that we talk and read about Shelley. See, I think we, uh, most of us here, 
come out of it a political tradition which is part of a, a sectarian world, a tradition where reaching people was not our problem because no one appeared to want, it to, want to be reached, uh, a tradition in which we were isolated from the masses, and as we were isolated from the masses, so it became necessary to uh, turn in upon one another, uh, turn in upon other people who had come to the same revolutionary ideas, or roughly the same revolutionary ideas that we had come, and develop therefore a tradition of speaking and writing, and a, a tradition of language which is very much separated from the speaking or reading of, 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 the, of the masses. It was, uh, we, we isolated ourselves and developed what I like to call a kind of uh, internal bulletinese, a sort of language which was always worried all the time about the great hideous line who was standing above you like some massive ghost. Will we write in order with the line? And if we weren't in order with the line, we'd better trim our language and what we said basically to what the line was going to tell us. Were we, had we got the, 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 the right way of saying the right thing so that we wouldn't get stabbed in the back by the IMG or the SLL or whatever other person who happened to be sitting around in the meeting because there was no one real in the meeting at all, everyone in the meeting was unreal and therefore you had to develop a language that was unreal and a language which they only understood, we developed an absolutely disgusting line in polemical bile, just a way of denouncing people, we became very very good at denouncing other people, always smashing them, exposing them, uh, alien agents of the Pentagon. We developed a way of talking about people as though they were hostile to us. We thought that everybody else was hostile to us. We came out of a tradition which was uh, very, very much in that area. Now the point about it is this. Everybody knows that that is changing. Changing very, very fast. Changing faster than we can cope with all the time. And the point is we have to develop a language which suits the change. Because we are for moving the masses. We are for doing what Asia did at Demogorgon. And we can only do that if we develop a language which is suited to that, a language which people can understand, a language which has some bite and zest and enthusiasm in it. That's what we have to do. And that's why I think the reading of great revolutionary poets like Shelley is fundamentally important for people to understand all kinds of images, all kinds of uh, uh, similes, metaphors, ways of saying things, different ways of saying things, the great masters of language, the people who knew, really understood language, could use it, really like great musicians use a piano, could use it, those things we need to soak up, we need to really go back and soak it up, particularly when those great masters of language were in line with our politics and in line with what we would say. And then I would say there's another thing, but it isn't when we go to people, when you're talking to people, arguing to people, all the time, you see in, in factory situations sometimes, in places in the, uh, in the street where people are arguing with people, you see them arguing about, I don't know, the cuts or something like that, and they're arguing about the cuts in ways which they're immediately talking to people and, understand that, and they see somebody coming up, a, uh, a member of the, I don't know, a member of the Central Committee or, or uh, a member of some other tendency or something of that kind, and you actually really do see people change in midstream. They're talking away and trying to talk about people's children and their lives and trying to get them to understand and being on a level with somebody and talking along that level with something. Suddenly, you see them snap into the old routine, bloody, ritualistic rhetoric, well, uh, and you see the worker that they're talking to, and that confused look of embarrassment, unease, my God, what the hell is all this about? It's nothing to do with us who have to, uh, uh, have to go away and find the first excuse to go away and pay no attention to them. And these are the things that matter, the, 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 the advantages that we get above all. It's difficult to read. People often say, a lot of the poems are difficult to read, but they're the glory that you get out of reading it, the value in the language, being able to turn it round, being able to use the language and the metaphors and the similes all the time, is fundamentally important. Another thing that I think is uh, 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 very, very central to our, the way we've grown up, if you like, politically, is that because we were so small, and because we were really isolated from the outside world, we developed a scepticism. Uh, a, 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 a certain belief about the way in which people who said they were going to do things and didn't do things. All kinds of people who promised that they would do things after the election if they got elected to office. 
all kinds of Communist Party people who were very sentimental about freedom and liberty but didn't appear to be doing anything about freedom or liberty. And therefore we developed a, a scepticism, a scepticism about that, a scepticism which to some extent shaped our language and our attitudes. We were sceptical all the time, worried about that, and we uh, it grew out of that. It wasn't an unhealthy thing. We grew. The fact that we're here at all is partly to do with the fact that people held the line and they held the line sceptically. They were able to say we don't go in with that kind of thing because that's bloody sentimentalism and we don't go in with that kind of thing because that's reformism and opportunism. We don't go in with those kind of things. We stick to where we are. But the problem now is much more serious than that. The problem is that there is a line drawn between scepticism and cynicism and that line is an extremely narrow one. It's very, very easy for the sceptic to topple over into being a cynic. And a cynic can never be a revolutionary. Absolutely impossible to be a revolutionary for a cynic because they don't see the possibilities. They don't believe that it's possible that, uh, that, that working people can change their lives and change society. And therefore there's a danger all the time that we hold to the scepticism, hold, if you like, to what we believe to be the line and don't do the task that's most unfortunate most important for us, which is among the working people of this country to, to unlock the enthusiasm, the excitement that exists in every human being. That's what changes people around more than anything, to allow people to be enthusiastic, to have the enthusiasm and the energy for changing the society, to come away from that dreary scepticism with which we managed to keep ourselves together over a period in which we were isolated, and go into the masses with an enthusiasm, with a feeling that society can be changed, that every militant in a factory, every woman, I was I was in a factory, a blanket factory in Yorkshire the other day. They're talking to a woman of 59, mad, crippled with arthritis, losing 25 pounds a month because she was there because of an occupation of the factory in line, because she wants to fight to save the factory and not take her pension, which she could get 25 pounds a month. And you sit opposite this woman and you feel there is nothing that distinguishes the two of us. Nothing. We are absolutely together in the battle. Her infusion, I wanted to fight. I'm not having these bastards on my back. I'm with you. We feel that even, even then you feel a little bit embarrassed about saying who you are, where you come from, what paper you represent, because you feel that the tradition is cut off from that fighting tradition. And all the time we have to move those together. We have to find the ways in which they're infused. I think enthusiasm is the center piece to it. All the time the enthusiasm, all the things about Shelley that really inspires people, inspires me, inspires, inspires numbers of people over 150, 160 years since he died. The thing that matters above all is the enthusiasm that the world can be changed. It's shaking all his poetry, all the stuff about the West Wind. Then you come and read the stuff about the West Wind when he writes about the pestilence-stricken multitudes, the leaves being blown by the wind, and he sees the leaves as all those multitudes of people stricken by pestilence. You begin to see, when you see his ideas, his enthusiasm, his love of life, he believed in life. He really felt that life was what mattered, that life could and should be better than it is could be better and should be better and should be changed. That was the thing he believed in most of all, the thing that makes me most furious is when people say that he committed suicide, that he ran that ship into the storm on purpose. Nothing could be further than the truth. There he was in Leghorn, rushing around, arranging his plans for a political quarterly with Hunt, rushing about, seeking now to go back to Jane Williams, to go and meet somebody else. The sky was beautiful, the weather was good, he loved the boat. He loved life, he loved life all the time, and all the time that he loved it. He saw the way in which it was damaging masses and masses of people around him and saw the need to change. In the same way, as on perhaps a Sunday morning, when you're lying there in bed on a Sunday morning, no meetings, no demonstration that Sunday morning, that's terrific. And you're lying there, there, and you're lying there drinking your one cup of coffee a week. And you're lying there thinking, well, this is great. And the sun's coming through the window and you're bantering with the children. And you think, well, you know, life's pretty good, really. It's pretty good. Life's all right. I've got nothing really to complain about in life. I think this is pretty good. And then you pick up the bloody Sunday Times or the Observer and you read in there about some people in Chile or in Cyprus or in some woman's body that's been broken at the hand of some torture or executioner and you begin to feel the rage, the fury boiling up in you. You begin to feel that fury. But there's the life that could be. It is there. And there's the life that should be. And the difference between what could be and sh what should be on the one hand and what is on the other hand is intolerable and it has to be changed and it can only be changed by the action of the masses. Just the way in which hundreds of us feel like that the whole time. So Shelley there basking in the sunlight in Leghorn in 1819, coming down to breakfast, chatting to, to, to his family, talking quietly, enjoying life, thinking of the boat trip that he was going to have that day, thinking of the wind and the sun and the stars, and suddenly the papers come in from England 
and the papers tell the story of the massacre of women and children at, at Peterloo. And he flies up into the attic, furious, rage furious. And he writes that poem, The Mask of Anarchy. He didn't have a socialist workers party to activate through. That was his problem. He didn't have a party, an organization, no one around him. But he had the ability to write there. He had the ability to write the fury, the resentment, the appeal for revolution which all of us must feel. And this slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration. Eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. And these words shall then become like oppression's thunder doom ringing through each heart and brain, heard again, 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 rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number, shake your chains to earth like dew which in sleep has fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few.